Hello, historical geology students. This is video number 17, the third one for this week. I've already done 15, 16, and 17. And I have one more video, video 18, coming up. And you need to watch those four videos to get ready for the final exam. Uh, video 17 is about chapter 18, Life of the Cenozoic Era. So that's what we're going to talk about. And the, you, you might recall that 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and marine reptiles became extinct. And the world was, there was a competition for who would dominate during the Cenozoic era. The winner is the mammals. The mammals are the dominant species on our, a dominant type of organism on our planet starting in the Cenozoic era. So, Many people call the Cenozoic Era the age of the mammals, just as we call the Mesozoic Era the age of the dinosaurs. Um, there's different kinds of mammals we'll look at. I've already talked about characteristics that mammals have that give them advantage, such as being warm-blooded, the mothering instinct, mother's milk, a four-chambered heart, allowing for a larger brain, differentiated teeth, that means teeth that serve different functions, such as molars, incisors, and canines. Um, while the animal world was dominated by mammals during the Cenozoic era, the plants, the, wor the plant world get was dominated by angiosperms. We talked about angiosperms last time. Those are plants that have flowers, nuts, or fruits, or nectars or something to attract the insects, birds, uh, and mammals. Fruits are another, uh, angiosperms can also have fruits. And so they use the animal world to spread their seed. The skies are no longer dominated by pterosaurs. Those flying reptiles died out 65 million years ago along with the dinosaurs. So the Cenozoic era, the skies are dominated by birds. Please don't forget that birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs during the Jurassic period. But they wouldn't dominate the skies until the Cenozoic era. The three main types of invertebrates that dominate during the Cenozoic are gastropods, these are benthic creatures, snails and slugs, that belong to phylum mollusca. So snails really start to dominate both um, underneath the uh, in the oceans and on the land. Then we have bivalves. Bivalves almost completely replaced brachiopods in um, their ecological niche. So things like oysters, things like clams, things th like mussels and scallops. Brachiopods dominated that part of the biological world during the Paleozoic. During the Mesozoic, there was mostly bivalves, but still a lot of brachiopods. But by Cenozoic time, uh, the bivalves dominate over the brachiopods. And then we have these types of echinoderms that really start to flourish and dominate the shallow seas in the benthic environment. These are called echi echinoids. In Latin, they're class Echinoidea, phylum echinodermata. Things like sand dollars and sea urchins really start to flourish and thrive during the Cenozoic. So the three types of invertebrates that really start to thrive during the Cenozoic are the gastropods, bivalves, and echinoids. In the beginning, after the dinosaurs became extinct, all of those ecological niches that used to be occupied by the dinosaurs were left open. And so there was an open competition, almost a war, to to, uh, to see who would dominate the world. 
who would replace the big plant-eating dinosaurs? Who would replace the carnivorous dinosaurs, the theropods like Tyrannosaurus rex? The predators were wiped out. And in the beginning, it didn't look that like the mammals would produce the top predators. In fact, in the beginning, during the quaternary period, giant birds were the dominant predators around the world. And these birds grew quite large. Look at this bird. It has, that's a horse in its mouth. So we're talking about, when I was a little kid and my <clears throat> parents took me to the Smith Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. to look at fossils, I was amazed to see how big those birds got. Look at them chasing these horses. Um, they were enormous with razor sharp beaks they could, the two muscular legs, they could run 20, 30 miles an hour. They usually hunted in twos and threes, and they dominated the world until something could eliminate them, and much later on. You know, this, once the saber-toothed cats evolved, we see that the birds disappear. So finally, they had met their match, but... In the beginning, the top predators in the Cenozoic world, especially during the tertiary, were giant birds. We're going to be talking about some different kinds of mammals since the Cenozoic is the age of the mammals. And the four types of mammals, there's four groups of mammals that we need to pay special attention to. And uh, I'm going to make a list for you here. So the four kinds of mammals, four kinds of mammals. We have the multi terbiculates who are now extinct, the monotremes, the marsupials, and the placentals. Now in previous videos I already talked about the difference between monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. So I'm not going to talk about that all over again. Uh, monotremes primitive. They have uh, they lay eggs. Things like the spiny anteater, duckbill platypus, marsupials, things like kangaroos and koala bears and opossums where the babies grow up in pouches and mammals that grow up in their mother's womb and feed on the placenta, like we did when we were in our mother's womb. But there was a fourth type of mammal that was quite common uh, in the beginning of the Cenozoic during the tertiary period. You probably haven't heard about these before. These are the multi turbiculates. Here you can see what a multi-turbiculate looks like. Yes, I know you think it looks like a mouse, but it's not a mouse. Let's take a look at its teeth. It has one big tooth coming out of its lower jaw and another tooth that comes up at the very tip of its upper jaw and then it has its molars back here. These multi-turbiculates oftentimes had a prehensile tail. This is called a prehensile tail. Let me spell it for you here. Prehensile tail is a type of tail that multiturbiculus had. They used to hang on to the limbs on trees and bushes so that they wouldn't fall out of the tree. They could hang on with this tail. There's a muscle on this tail that helped it stay up in the trees. And creatures that stay up in the trees we need to know what they, they're called. They're called arbor, arboreal. Arboreal. Arboreal an, animals can live in the trees. Some monkeys are arboreal. 
and they also have prehensile tails, as we'll see later. But of these four types of mammals, which one dominates? The placentals. Why? Because they have an advantage, as Darwin would say. The placenta in the mother's womb allows for the baby to grow very mature and within the mother's womb, so it can stay there longer. And once it's, the mother gives birth, the baby has a higher chance of survival. In contrast, marsupials have to carry their babies in a pouch, leaving the mother encumbered. In other words, she has to carry all these babies in the pouch, and there's no father instinct. The father's not going to help. And so it's easy for placental mammals to attack them. And so wherever you see placentals and marsupials battled out for the top spot in the Cenozoic, placentals have that advantage. We can clearly see that because the world is dominated by placental mammals, except for Australia. Now, Australia was different because there were no placentals. And so the koala bears and Tasmanian devils and um, um, kangaroos and all of those marsupials uh, dominated Australia until the English arrived. And then what happened after the English arrived is they brought their dogs, their pigs, and their cows, and all these other placentals, and the marsupials started to disappear. And then what happened is finally the Australian government decided to protect the marsupials. And it was too late for certain types of marsupials who died out during uh, the time of the English um, set settlement of Australia. For example, let me give you an example. The Tasmanian wolf is gone. This is what it looked like. This is the last one. It died in 1930-something. So some of them didn't make it. But luckily, and to the credit of the Australian government, they passed a law protecting marsupials. Otherwise, they couldn't win because the placentals have the advantage. The monotremes died out. They no longer exist. The only marsupial we have in North America is what? The opossum. It's the only one left. Now, here is a list straight out of your book showing you all the different types of mammals that evolved from common ancestors in the Mesozoic into all of these different types. We don't have time to cover all of these because this is not a zoology class, but I wanted to cover the main ones. And you know the main types of mammals now, monotremes, marsupials, placentals, and um, multiturbiculates. But we will talk about a few different types. Please don't forget, monotremes still lay eggs. They include the platypus and the spiny anteater. Take a look at some photographs of these marsupials, wombats, opossums, kangaroos, pouched mammals. Placentals, what is the difference? Placentals have a placenta in the mother's womb, a food source for the embryo to feed on. Also, placental mammals produce milk through mammary glands. Here you can see a multi-turbiculate. These were quite common during the tertiary period. Here you can see it's arboreal. It's living up in the trees. It's got a prehensile tail. And it has those teeth, that one tooth on the bottom and one coming straight out of the upper jaw. OK, now we want to talk about what are primates. Well, simply said, 
primates are apes, monkeys, and hominids. Hominids are all types of humans, including us. Apes and monkeys are much different. And we're going to be talking about that a lot in the next chapter, chapter 19. But we can basically divide all primates into two orders, order prosimian and order anthropoid. Prosimians are primitive, small, arboreal monkeys that live in trees. They're also nocturnal, meaning that they sleep in the day and hunt at night. Anthropoidy are your are your all of your um, monkeys and apes and humans. Amongst mammals, there are your meat eaters. Meat eaters are your carnivores. So they're order carnivora. Order carnivora, class mammalia, phylum chordata. Carnivores have canine teeth, usually, or they have special teeth used to tear up meat. Humans are considered to be carnivores. Most carnivores have teeth that are made for killing, but they always have teeth for shearing and cutting meat apart. Carnivores include um, many types of whales, lions, tigers, and bears. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my! <laughs> what movie is that from? Uh, Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Anyway, wolves, dogs, humans, carnivores. What are ungulates? Ungulates are hooved mammals, and hooved mammals um, are quadrupeds. They walk on four legs, and they are plant eaters. Ungulates are plant eating mammals. Things like cows, pigs, camels, rhinoceros, horses, tapers, sloths. Anything that eats plants and walks on four legs is a hooved mammal and we call it an ungulate. If the hoof has an odd number of toes, such as for horses and rhinoceros, we, we say it is a parasodactyl. Or a parasodactyl, it's Latin, right? And it sounds like a long, complicated thing, hard to remember. Just remember this. Paraso means an odd number in English, and dactyl means toes. So parasodactyl ungulates have an odd number of toes. A horse has one toe, it's called the hoof. A rhinoceros has three toes, so that's an odd number. So it is a parasodactyl. Most ungulates, however, have an even number of toes. Ardeo means even. And so they, be they belong to the order artiodactyl, meaning they have an even number of toes, such as uh, cows, pigs, camels, goats. They all have an even number of toes, so they're artiodactyl. Not hard. If I can remember this, you can remember this. Hooved mammals divide into the odd, to odd number ones, parasodactyls, and the even number toes, artiodactyls. Most are artiodactyl. Horses are parasodactyl, odd number toes. All ungulates can be divided into two types. We have our browsers and our grazers. Browsers and gra grazers. Okay, so ungulates are either browsers or grazers. Uh, 
if you are an ungulate who is a browser, you are going to have this type of teeth. And this is called a low crown teeth. Low crowned, crowned teeth. If you are a grazer, you have this kind of tooth called a high crown teeth. High crown tooth. Notice there's a lot more tooth enamel separating the pulp from the mouth in the high crown tooth compared to the low crown teeth. The browsing ungulates with the low crown teeth specialized specialize in eating tender leaves off of trees. Things like uh, sloths, things like giraffes, um, or koala bears. They eat leaves off of trees, so they have these low crown teeth. They have no need for all this thick tooth enamel. However, ungulates that graze, like cows, and goats and rhinoceros, they eat grass, have thick teeth like this, high crown teeth. Why do the grazers have thick crown teeth? Well, when you eat grass, you're going to pick up a lot of grit and sand and particles, and it's going to eat away your, at your tooth enamel. So you need these big, um, thick teeth to protect this. Otherwise, you get your tooth decay will cause so much pain, it will become unbearable. So that's why grazers have high crown teeth. Browsers don't need that. They just leave tender, tender leaves off of trees. Low crown teeth, high crown teeth. I mentioned before that most of your ungulates are artiodactyls. What does that mean? They have an even number of toes. Deer, giraffes, camels all have an even number of toes. Hippos, pigs, parasidactyls have an odd number of toes. Things like horses and rhinoceros. Let's take a look at one type of ungulate that's of particular interest and that is horses. They're ungulates, they're parasidactyl, they have an odd number of toes. Now, this is what horses look like at the beginning of the Cenozoic era. And this is what they look like today. This is what their toes look like at the beginning of the Cenozoic, and this is what they look like today. This is what their teeth look like at the beginning of the Cenozoic, and this is what they look like today. In each case, ladies and gentlemen, you can see evolution at work. As the Cenozoic progresses to the modern day, does the body size of horses increase? Yes. So one trend we see is that horses evolve to become bigger. Notice their heads become bigger as well, meaning that their brain size is increasing. They go from l delicate little low crown teeth until about 10 million years ago they started to develop high crown teeth indicating that they evolved to eat grass they used to eat leaves off of trees and then 10 million years ago it's not a coincidence that 10 million years ago is when grass appeared on the world they adapted to the new food source and they developed high crown teeth. They also went to having three toes to one toe. It's all evolution, ladies and gentlemen. If you have a hoof, you can run faster. You have a higher chance of survival and you have a higher chance of passing on your DNA. So you could clearly see, I, mean, I have no doubt in my mind that evolution occurs. Because you just look at the fossils, the horses, they increase in body size. They lose their toes. They go from low crown teeth to high crown teeth. Doesn't mean there's not a creator. It just means that horses evolved to survive. And those who have what it takes to survive pass on their genetic information.
Another type of mammal we want to focus on is order proboscidea. Order proboscidea. And these mammals have a long trunk. The only ones that are still alive are elephants. But there's two other types of order proboscidea that um, we need to talk about. So the mammoths, mastodons, and elephants. The only ones that are, are alive in order proboscidea today are your elephants. Here you can see the difference. Here's an elephant from Africa. We also have them in India. Woolly mammoth with much more body hair. And notice the difference in their tusks. The tusks curve down and then back upwards like this. These are creatures that are adapted to the cold weather. And they thrive during the Pleistocene, during the Ice Age. Last ones died out about 7,000 years ago. Mastodons. They're also hairy, but they're smaller than the mastodon mammoths. And they're cur they're, the shape of their tusks is different. Notice how they curve gently upwards like this. These are very common in Tennessee. I know it's hard to imagine, but we find their skeletons all around Johnson City. So these thrived here in Tennessee just a million years ago. And you can see their skeletons if you go to the museum at Johnson City. Order, order proboscidea. Next thing we're going to talk about is the cyst is uh, and I'll spell it out for you. We're just covering the main types of mammals. Is order cetacea. Okay, order cetacea includes dolphins, porpoises, and whales. These are mammals that are adapted to swimming in the water. Let's take a look at, uh, for example, whales, order cetacea. There's two main kinds of whales. There's toothed whales, like an orca is a toothed whale. These are killers. They hunt, and they have teeth. Notice the sharp teeth. The second type of order cetacea, second type of whale, is your baleen whales. There's a spelling for you. These are the largest animals now in the water. The largest animals in the in the in the ocean are the baleen whales. And they eat the smallest creatures in the ocean. They eat the tiny plankton. Tiny microscopic creatures like this is what the biggest creatures in the ocean, animals in the ocean, eat the smallest. And they do so by using baleen. What is baleen? Well, this is what their teeth look like. They're like filters. This is what we call, uh, a ba it kind of looks like a filter, an air filter or something. It filters the water out using these baleen and removes the plankton. These are type of order cetacea. The whales, once again, are toothed whales or baleen whales. During the Ice Age, the Pleistocene, in other words, Mammals grew enormous. They grew large. For example, in Ireland, we have Irish elk. If you go to a pub in Ireland, in Dublin, you'll see these Irish elk, beautiful Irish elk. Look how huge they got. Last ones died out a couple thousand years ago. 
So mammals grew enormous during the Pleistocene. Why? Why? I can explain it by something called Cope's Rule. What is Cope's Rule? C-O-P-E-S. The colder the climate gets, the larger animals get. That Cope's Rule. So why did the mammals become large during the Pleistocene? Because it got cold. And that leads us to the next question. What is the advantage to having a larger body if you're living in a colder climate? Well, if you are bigger, you have a higher chance of surviving in a colder climate because you have more body fat. Body fat keeps you warmer, so you're less likely to freeze to death. Same with human beings. If you're a type of person who has a big body and a lot of body fat, your ancestors came from a colder climate. On the other hand, if you're short and skinny, your ancestors came from somewhere near the equator, where there's an advantage to being smaller. If you're larger in a warm climate, it's, it's, it's a disadvantage because you sweat more. You're more likely to get a heart attack or, 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 or uh, die of heat loss if you have a larger body. So during the Ice Age, mammals became very big. The Irish elk is an example of that. Some other examples of that are some of the big carnivores became quite large, including the cave bear. Look how big cave bears were compared to humans. They were enormous. Some people call them the short-necked bears. because They have big, short, muscular necks. Cave bears were one of our main worries when our Ice Age ancestors were living in the caves. You find caves where the cave bears would collect human bones. They had some intelligence. They would put the heads in one part of the cave, torsos in another part of the cave, legs in another. It was like a collection, like we collect stamps and coins. Cave bears, if you walked into the wrong cave during the Ice Age, you would become a meal for a cave bear. What other animals became huge during the Pleistocene? Well, we had dire wolves. And dire wolves were huge compared to modern wolves. Huge, di huge wolves. Another threat to our Ice Age ancestors were the dire wolves. But we ended up taking in the more docile ones and crossbreeding them over and over to make dogs. And dogs ended up becoming man's best friend and that actually helped us protect us during the Ice Age. Another example of mammals becoming huge during the Pleistocene are saber-toothed cats. Very common in Tennessee. Big muscular cats with two large canine teeth. Another one of our big enemies were the saber-toothed cats. If you go to Johnson City, go to the Gray Fossil Site Museum, you can find dozens of skeletons of these that were found in the Johnson City area. These were here in Tennessee. These were the end of the giant birds, too. They hunted out the giant birds. Um, some Two more examples, and we'll, we'll go on, of the Pleistocene producing large mammals are the giant sloths and here's a giant sloth skeleton look how large these ungulates were enormous they look like that they're very common in Tennessee too find their bones in East Tennessee Okay, uh, actually, we'll call it, here's, this is called a glyptodont, 
an ancient ancestor of the armadillo, but it's much larger than the modern day armadillo, maybe 25 times bigger with a mace on it at the end of its tail. I think you get the point. During the Ice Age, mammals became larger. During the Pleistocene, mammals became larger to adapt to the cold weather. Um, about 11,700 years ago, the Earth started to warm up. And that would be the beginning of the modern era, which we call the Quaternary. Um, the Quaternary period, not era. Um, there's also one last picture here in this chapter. Here you can see an interesting story that um, during the Cenozoic, North America was dominated by placental mammals. South America was dominated by marsupials, and there was no Central America yet. So Geocondos, Costa Rica did not exist yet. There was water. There was an open uh, seaway between the Caribbean and the Pacific Ocean. So the placentals could not meet with the marsupials until three million years ago. Three million years ago, North America collided with South America making Central America. That's how Central America formed three million years ago. All of a sudden, the placental mammals could migrate down south, and they did so. And they wiped out the indigenous marsupial population. Wherever placentals meet marsupials, marsupials are wiped out. The marsupials also could cross into the north, but due to their disadvantages, they could not, they were wiped out. Uh, the only one that successfully colonized the north is the opossum. The opossum is the only successful marsupial. So that's it for the chapter 18. And I'm going to have, which is uh, video 17. I'm going to have one more video coming up, video 18. I'll see you then.